people do what they do to take care of what's important to them. For some people it's prestige, for some people it's expiation of guilt, for some people it's feeling good about themselves, for some people it's building something for the future. For some people it's power, for some people it's visibility. And I'm going to use the word values to say values drive all behavior. And anybody who's going to give money away to some organization, some institution, is going to give it to that institution which they perceive is the best one they can give it to to take care of what's important to them. So it becomes very important to understand what's important to them. I said you sell whatever those people are willing to give the money up for. Prestige, power, visibility, immortality. You're selling whatever it is that's important to them that they feel will be taken care of best if they give the money to you. Values drive behavior through perceptions. That's the key concept. It's your unwillingness to do what works. That's the first thing to face up to when you're influencing people. You take 100% responsibility for your effectiveness. Right now we take zero. We always put it on something else or somebody else external to us. And as soon as you want to take 100% responsibility, you can't believe how powerful you can be. So on the one hand, we take the self paralytic position. There's no way I can do it. And the next word out of our mouth is a false imperative, a denial of McCabe's law. If I had somebody follow you around all day and every time they saw it, you, you saw, heard, thought, wrote, heard, read an imperative, our, our world is full of false imperatives. How many imperatives do you think you'd encounter in a day? Over a hundred. Our language is jammed with hyperbole. Must, have to, got to, necessary, require, essential, mandatory, obligatory, the only way. Nobody has to do anything, but gee whiz, they have to do this. When a colleague comes to me and says, Charles, we have to do such and such, I say, really, what if we, what if we don't? <laughs> to which the usual thoughtful response is, well, nothing much, I guess. <laughs> Well, then what was the force of your imperative? You know, it's, you, know, you know McCabe's law is true. When did you learn that in your life? At what age did you learn McCabe's law? By what age were you a master of McCabe's law? Thirteen. Three. <laughs> Johnny, you have to eat your peace. No, I don't. <laughs> Johnny, you have to go to sleep now. No, I don't. Johnny, you have to pick up your clothes. No, I don't. By the time you're three, you know McCabe's law. And you, you, you contradict it every day of your life. We must, we have to. God, there are no imperatives. So on the one hand, get rid of the self paralytic position. I can't do it. There's, everything's against me. Get rid of the false imperatives. We must, we have to, we got to. No, 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 no. Human influence is somewhere in between. We tend to talk about what we want from people in terms of attitudes, dispositions, personality, characteristics, and qualities of relationship. And that's bad news. You didn't start life that way. What did you want when you were born? Food. You weren't looking for love or admiration or acceptance or approval. <laughs> You're looking for food, you're looking for comfort, you're looking for entertainment. You want a specific behaviors coming from the environment towards you. Then by the time you're about three years old, because of the mental development, you begin to introduce to all these other concepts of, oh yes, acceptance, approval, embarrassment. And so we start talking about what we want from people. I want respect, I want support, I want recognition, I want approval. Bad way to think about what you want from people. Those are squishy, subjective terms. They mean very different things to different people. But in addition to that, has it ever occurred to you why people don't do what you want them to do often? They don't know what you want them to do. They don't know what you want, they want, you, to do, but you, what you want them to do because you use the left-hand column. Clean up your rack, a little more uh, team spirit from you, a little more motivation from you, a little more creativity from you. Say what? <laughs> so you try to give me what you think I want. And I say, that's not what I had in mind, Marie. Well, what did you have in mind? Well, I'm not going to tell you, but I'll let you know when I see it. Keep up the good work. <laughs> but in addition to not being concrete enough, the left-hand column is usually in the negative. He's disorganized. She's not very competent. He's not very bright. He's not a team player. And as soon as you, as soon as you put a negative label on another person or a group of persons, you put a huge, possibly insurmountable obstacle, psychological obstacle between you and them in terms of positive human influence. I'm not making a moral point here. I'm making a pragmatic one. We love the negative. We've been taught to love the negative since age three. We look for problems and disconnects all the time. We're mesmerized by the evening news. What's, what's the mantra for the evening news director? If it bleeds, it leads. If it bleeds, it leads. Very good. Let's show them the blood on the pavement. That'll get their attention. We love bad news. This is a disease in most cultures. Your children, age three, are being taught negative, 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 negative. Stop thinking in the left-hand column. Start thinking in terms of the right-hand column. Behaviors. Performances, observable, measurable, quantifiable. But a, it's a huge psychological leap for anyone to make. Why do we get attracted to the left hand column, the squishy, subjective, and often negative labeling of people and situations? It's easy. It's much easier to put a broad brush label on people than it is to figure out exactly what you want them to do. What are we often looking for when we're influencing people in addition to getting the behavior and performance we want? 
Validation of our own thoughts, our own feelings. That's too much. I don't go for that. I don't need any validation. I need to influence behavior and performance. That's all. But most of all, do you know why we use the left-hand column? It's an ego game. It's an ego game. We're claiming our own superiority. She's not a team player. He's not very bright. She's not very competent. He's disorganized. I wouldn't put those negative labels on other people if they were true of me, would I? So what am I saying about me? I'm smart. I'm competent. I'm well organized. That phrase I would suggest you get rid of, by the way, if you want to influence people. He just doesn't get it. Oh, I see. You get it and he doesn't. A little arrogant on your part. He gets it fine. He doesn't like it. And if he doesn't get it, you haven't been clear enough. Well, he wasn't paying attention. You weren't interesting enough. He didn't buy in. You weren't persuasive enough. 100% you, 0% him. But we do just the opposite, don't we? We blame them when they don't come around and do what we want them to do. So I would suggest from now on, if you really want power with people, you get very clear in your head about what you want. Observable behavior or patterns of behavior or measurable quantifiable performance. You do not need agreement, need agreement on ends to get cooperation on means. We spend so much time getting, trying to get people to agree with, oh, we're all in this together, we're all believe, we all believe the same thing. Well, we're not all in it together and we don't believe the same thing and that's fine. Put something in front of people that's important to them and tie what's important to, to, to them to what you want them to do. It's very simple as a concept. A little more difficult when you pull it off. And as we will see, when you understand different people are motivated to do things for different reasons, you will then take your approach and hone it down to a series of individuals or small, small groups who do have something in common that they want served in their values. That's what it's about. I will give you money when I perceive giving you money is the best thing I can do to take care of what's important to me. me. Got it? What's the, what's the stuff on the right-hand side? This, this is the stuff of human influence. Rhetoric. Rhetoric. Good, good, good one. Style. Spin. Huh? Packaging. The sad conclusion I came to many years ago is that the stuff of human influence is fluff. The stuff of human influence is packaging. Nuance. The words you use, the timing you use, the tone you use, that's what it is. That's a sad conclusion to come to. If you don't like it, get yourself a cozy cave in the backwoods of Maine where you can live as a hermit the rest of your life because there's only one game in town and that is the behavioral fragments of you, of you are all you have to influence anybody else on the face of the earth. Not your good intentions, not your wisdom, not your knowledge, not your skill, not your authority, not your position. Your fragments of behavior as interpreted by them. What's a fragment? Well, we're going to that a word, a gesture, a tone, a, a way to dress, a way to talk, timing. These are all little fragments. And you build your mosaic out of those fragments. But if you do it consciously and deliberately to make those fragments go through people's fillers, you are more powerful. That's a sad thing to conclude. Truth doesn't count. It really doesn't. If it did, we couldn't have liars and cheats and propagandists and con artists who were successful. So I'm not telling you to con people. I'm saying taking a page out of the con artist's book, understand what they understand. It's not what is, it's what's perceived to be. That's also unless you get let go of your ego. People aren't going to do it for your reasons, they're going to do it for their reasons. That's fine. I don't care why they do it as long as they do it. But again, we want that validation deep down. And so as long as we're going for validation, we're distracting ourselves from human influence. Direct and indirect, what we say, how, when, where, gestures, timing, tone, language, and that's the stuff. It shouldn't count. It's all that counts. I will now share with you the two most uh, powerful words in the English language for getting compliance with a request. These two have been studied, the first one in particular. In terms of evidence, the most powerful word in the English language for getting compliance with a request is the subordinate conjunction known as because. You put because in front of your reasons and your reasons have to be relevant to the, uh, the influencee. You've increased the leverage of that reason 32% consistently. A little word, a subordinate conjunction increases the likelihood by 32%, yeah. Time after time after time. Isn't that amazing? Words have power. We have a lot of subconscious processing in our head. The fellow named Cialdini calls it click word, click word, click word, subconscious processing. And the belief is when an American or a user of the English language hears the word because, there's a subconscious automatic click word because. He has reasons. I'm a reasonable human being. I wish to be perceived as a reasonable human being. You and me, go, go ahead. They don't even know why they said yes, but 32% more people say yes when you put the word because in the, fr in the uh, script. Isn't that scary? Imagine. You want people to engage their imagination in deciding whether to do or not to do what you want them to do. 
This is when I give, I do a lot of work in the financial area with finan what used to be called financial advisors. They have a new label. Do you know what the new label for financial advisors is? Wealth managers. I tell them they should be called poverty managers, but they don't, they don't go for that. <laughs> They're not going to hand out a card, poverty manager. <laughs> I say, find out what that's, what's important to that person. Well, let's say, uh, you know, his commitment to his, his grandchildren. That's what he just, he just dotes on his grandchildren. And you turn to him and say, imagine 22 years from now, when your granddaughter is graduating from college because of the action you took today, how that's going to feel. Whoa. Sends chills up my spine. Huh? It gets the imagination involved in the decision process, positively. So start using those words. Stories. The academic community is finally catching up with the rest of the world. People have known about the power of stories ever since there have been campfires and language. Journalists have known about it forever. Tell a story, tell a story, tell a story. You read a headline, four million be made homeless by your earthquake. The story's not about four million people, that's a, that's a, that's a, a, a statistic. The story is almost always about a, a particular family with real names, real ages, real losses, and preferably a photograph. Because that's the way, uh, that's the way uh, brains interpret information. They're, they hold stories much better than they do facts. You're a good storyteller, get to be a better one. You're not a good storyteller, practice being a storyteller. How? Read the Reader's Digest. It's wall-to-wall -wall stories about people, formula stories about people. Collect stories. Stories are very, very influential items. They bring the imagination and the, uh, the emotions, come bring, they bring them to bear on the decision process. Any of you see the, uh, the, the uh, commercial that uh, Obama, did, Obama did right before the election on all the major channels, major networks, half hour? It wasn't a talking head. He understands. What was it? Five stories told by five people. Let's hear it from the people themselves. Here's the story one, here's story two, story three, story four, story five. He's a pretty good storyteller. If someone would ask me in guruish fa fashion, what's the pur purpose of life? My answer is the purpose of life is to serve your intrinsic values, the things that are ultimately important to you, okay? Whatever those things are. We use our behavior in the service of our values. Our behavior comes in two varieties. One, Feel-good behaviors, directly and immediately serve our values. Eat a good meal, watch a ball game, concert, ballet, opera. And behaviors that are effective with others, which we'll talk about some examples in just a moment. Where's our biological default, A or B? A, see you know what we do? We engage in A, hope it's a B when it's not, blame them. What, 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 what don't we do? We don't come over here, why? This is the effective stuff that doesn't feel good. This is the feel good that isn't effective. For most of us, there isn't much overlap between the two. You want more power with people? You have to find more of these and be willing to engage in them despite the fact that they have ego costs and risks. For example, what are three-year-olds really good at? Three-year-olds have to influence people for almost everything they want in life. Saying no. They say no, but what are the positive behaviors they engage in? Cute. Cutes. Well, my experience with my grandchildren says they're very, uh, very willing to say, I need your help. Mommy, would you help me? Daddy, would you help me? They learn very early in life asking for help is a very powerful way of influencing people. By the time they're four and five, what do they learn in this culture? Asking for help is a sign of weakness. It's not American. I checked it, by the way. It's Bolivian. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you wondered about all the things that are labeled un-American? Which nationality said, oh, that's us? Thank you very much. We don't, won't, don't, won't do what works because we won't pay the freight. We don't want to pay the cost. Gee, if I ask you for help, I'm saying you're the kind of person who helps people. I'm sharing ownership with you. I'm sharing recognition with you. And I've just become indebted to you. That's right. That's why it works. When I finally learned this lesson, I stopped telling my kids what to do and started asking them for help. You told them what to do, got resistance. Asked them for help, almost always got the behavior. It's the package. That's a far more attractive package to kids than being told what to do, particularly adolescents and teenagers. What else are little kids good at, positively? Recognition, praise, thanks, appreciation, and gratitude. They learn that one early in life, too. I do something for one of my grandchildren. What's my reward? Hug. Am I now when you do anything they have in mind? They know that one, too, by the way. Yeah. Don't go back hugging people. Get you in court. <laughs> but I'm dead serious about this. Get yourself a, a box of thank you notes. And every time someone engages in a significant behavior or performance you'd like to see repeated in the future, dash off a little 15 second, 15 second note. Date it, sign it, specify the behavior, specify the appreciation, watch your power grow. People are hungry for recognition, appreciation. Are there risks in doing that? Sure, the people who don't get to get their noses out of joint. People begin to expect it from you, that's right. 
but it works. But again, we focus on the negative. We have to put out the fire. We don't, we don't have to put in the fire, fire detectors, smoke detectors. Let me mention a couple more. They're not for three-year-olds, but you know them. The easiest way in the world to get your boss to enthusiastically endorse and help implement one of your ideas. Give them ownership, but that's, people, people understand, bosses often resist ownership till they're sure it's going to work. So I will give you an intermediate stage strategy. Make it absolutely clear if it does work, the boss gets all the praise, glory, and, and, and merit, and if it doesn't work, you get all the blame. It's going to happen that way anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing magnanimous about offering the inevitable. But that doesn't feel good. No, it doesn't, but it's very powerful. You call home tonight, one of the kids answers the phone, you start to talk to one of the kids, it's clear you're talking to them and they're not understanding what's going on. What's your immediate hypothesis as to why there's been a breakdown in communication knowing that you are a clear and reasonable communicator? Pardon? They're distracted. They? They're distracted. They're distracted. Worse than that. They're not listening. Or they're, <laughs> well, they're misinterpreting. That's not what I said. That you, don't, you, don't, you don't understand. What kind of a response is that? Where are you putting the, 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 the burden of proof for the breakdown in communication? Mm -hmm. On them. So if you, ha you have a conversation with one of your children tonight on the phone or your spouse, and there's a breakdown in communication as you're trying to communicate to them, you stop and you say, I must not have said that very well. Let me try that again. That's the script. I must not have said that very well. Let me try that again. That couldn't have been clear. Let me try that again. I must not have said that very well. Let me try that again. That couldn't have been clear. Let me try that again. Just try it. Just try it. See if you can, see if you can get that out of your, out of your es esophagus. Well, why they weren't listening? They weren't listening because you weren't interesting enough. They didn't understand because you weren't clear enough. They didn't buy in because you weren't persuasive enough. 100% you, 0% them.